Praise the Lord. This is Pastor Joseph. Welcome to Christianity, Islam, and America. Indeed, I'm Pastor Joseph, your host here from the Trinity Channel. We're so glad that you're watching our program. You're about to see a program with information that you're unlikely to see anywhere else. So please stay tuned. We are a ministry that loves the Lord Jesus Christ and we seek to exalt Him, exposing false religions and errors which uh, can hurt the body of Christ as we exalt the uh, full counsel of God's Word. We're going to be looking tonight at a program that was recorded some time ago that uh, t deals with the topic that is in the minds of so many Americans and even those around the world today. Does the Quran teach war? Is the religion of Islam a peaceful religion? Or is it a religion that is violent from its very beginning? Is it inherently violent? This is a question that seems to continue to bring itself back up time and time again, especially every time we have a terrorist uh, incident when someone who commits an act of terror is a Muslim and does so in the name of Islam, perhaps shouting Allahu Akbar, we wonder, especially when our past president would tell us uh, time after time that Islam has nothing to do with terrorism. But Barack Obama was not the only president who's made such claims. George Bush said the same thing. And unfortunately, most of our government seems to wish to toe a line of political correctness. It's not only in politics. Unfortunately, this has uh, tainted our education system and certainly our media as well. Where do we find the truth? about religion, the religion of Islam in particular, such a hot-button political issue right here at Christianity, Islam, and America with the Trinity Channel and their top-notch Christian apologetics from around the world. We have Christian speakers, PhDs, debaters, those who've been missionaries in foreign lands who know the religion of Islam inside and out, former Muslims who've come to Christ who are exposing this religion, the second largest religion in the world, second, of course, to Christianity, uh, not in order to attack the religion, but to compare and contrast the crescent moon which wanes and grows darker with the Son of Righteousness, Jesus Christ, the religion of Christ, Christianity, arising with healing in His wings. We're looking tonight at a program entitled, Does the Quran Teach War? Perhaps some of you are familiar with Jihad Watch, perhaps the most famous uh, jihad blog around the world, or anti-jihad blog, I should say, by Robert Spencer, a well-renowned author, often on uh, news media outlets as far as someone who is brought in as a conservative analyst, generally on Fox News, but sometimes on other news outlets. He is debating in our program tonight a Muslim, Mubin Sheikh, on this issue, is Islam inherently violent? Does the Quran teach war? Well, I think you're going to see very clearly that the religion of Islam does teach war. Muhammad himself practiced war, and as uh, Robert and Mubin get into the debate, they're discussing this passage in chapter 9 of the Quran, chapter 9, verse 29, which specifically instructs Muslims to fight, to fight against Christians and Jews. Indeed, until they either become Muslims or until they become subjugated to the rule of the dhimmi. Now that's a funny word for us, D-H-I-M-M-I. -M -M -I. You'll hear it referred to a few times in the debate, dhimmitude or dhimmi or the dhimmi laws. These are laws placed on Christians and Jews by Muslims who would conquer their lands. Laws that Muslims say were put into place to protect Christians and Jews laws that uh, Christians and Jews and others say were put into place to subjugate and to extort Christians and Jews. We're going to go back and look at the source material, the Quran itself, for you to decide. Indeed, is Islam a violent religion? Does it teach war and terror? Is that war and terror uh, rightly received by Muslims today? Those Muslims like ISIS and Osama bin Laden, who of course is now dead, but others, terrorist organizations, Al-Qaeda, his group that he founded lives on, and many others, Boko Haram, they all claim to commit acts of terror and war in the name of Islam, according to the religion of Islam, according to Muhammad's teachings, according to the Quran, and that's right, even the traditions of Islam, the Hadith, 
Well, we're going to find out with this debate. This is Pastor Joseph, your host with Christianity, Islam, and America from the Trinity Channel. To find out more about our ministry, go to our website, www.trinitychannel.com, because you're about to see a clip that you're unlikely to see anywhere else on broadcast television. You can find more at our website, trinitychannel.com. After the clip, I'll be back to discuss it with you and a little bit more about our ministry, how you can pray for us, and how you can find out more, learn more, and get involved in this worldwide ministry, exposing falsehood and exalting our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's go to the clip. Of unbelievers, um, of course, Robert will be uh, arguing in the affirmative, and Mobin will be arguing in the negative. And um, just real quick, the structure of the show: we will have um, an opening statement from both speakers, a, uh, two rebuttals, a crossfire, and then closing statements. And then at that time, we will uh, open up the phone lines for the audience to call in and uh, ask your questions and uh, just provide us your comments on tonight's debate. And of course, as always, the studio line is open here at ABN, which is 248-416-1300, 248-416-1300. At this time, I will uh, provide the uh, first opening statement to uh, Mobin. You have seven minutes, Mobin, to provide uh, the audience your opening statement, and you can uh, start whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm ready now. I've started my own stopwatch, so... Uh, thank you very much for having me. First of all, I uh, begin in the name of the one God of Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon all the prophets, known and unknown. Secondly, uh, thanks for the introduction for Robert as well. One of my aims has been to dismantle some of the uh, false intelligence, bad intel that Robert's been giving the intelligence community in the U.S. Uh, I am, in fact, on my way to see well, one in next month. Uh, the FBI, counterterrorism division, etc. Basically, what's happened is this kind of narrative that Robert Spencer has been promoting has become very destructive and harmful for counterterrorism purposes. Um, it is depicting an entire community as suspect and hostile. And it's easy to say that while most Muslims don't do this, but Islam teaches this. And in the implication is that while most of us are not right Muslims, we should be blowing ourselves up. But let me just make it very easy, I think, for all of us in that Robert's argument will fall apart very easily as soon as a person can show even one verse in which the non-believers are not supposed to be attacked or harmed. If it's all about war and subjugation, my first question would be, please write this down, I'm expecting an answer. How is it even possible that the Quran talks about peace treaties if... It's all about war and subjugation. Point number two. You know, Robert really likes to quote chapter 9, verse 29. Fight those who do not believe in Allah in the last day and so on. And one of the things that Robert does uh, a lot of the times is he takes verses out of their context. And I was, I was amused to, uh, to read some of the comments, uh, Robert, on uh, Jihad Watch. Uh, one of them was... Uh, the Muslim guy doing public safety, isn't that like the, the, the fox guarding the hen house? And I mean, what can I say? I love chicken. Um, you know, but to, to associate being Muslim and there being some, some problem between the two, I, I, I really need to speak out against that. So if you look at chapter 9, and it, you can go right to the early verses. So chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 4, verse 6, 7, and 10, they will all talk about pagans who are violating their treaties this is not about just fight everyone you know no qualifiers but it's referring to pagans who broke their treaties with the muslims because then you will see in verse four uh, those pagans with whom you have entered into an alliance and important point who have not subsequently failed you nor aided anyone against you fulfill your engagements with them so you see it's not possible for Islam, for the Quran to teach wholesale fighting against anyone who's not Muslim just because they're not Muslim. To quote that verse, Robert, as Robert does, 929, over and over as if by sheer repetition it becomes fact, you, you really have to look at the verses that come before it. This is what being in context means. So as I just did, I showed you verse 4, you can read verse 5. Um, verse 6, all of it is, look, like, look at verse 6, if, once, if one amongst the pagans asks you for asylum, grant it to him. 
so that he may hear the word of Allah and then escort him to where he can be secure. That is because they are men without knowledge. So it's showing you again that uh, there's certainly, there's no instruction to just wholesale go out and just start killing people. Uh, I'll give you another verse from the Quran. Um, Do not let your hatred of a people cause you to be unjust to them. Rather, you must be just to everyone. This is, what, this is why Allah said, be just, that is closer to piety. Uh, on that verse, do not let enmity between you and others cause you to be unjust in your dealings and rulings with them su su such that you oppress them due to the enmity that is between you. So it's telling you, you should not be doing this. Um, and one of my favorite ones, Al-Qurtubi, he's a scholar who quote, from the 12th century, he's giving a, a, an exegesis statement on this verse. And again, you're going to find, I know Robert uh, does this, he'll quote some scholars from here, some scholars from there, and this is good. The problem is when you find other scholars saying other things. It's one thing to make the argument that Islam or the Quran teaches war and subjugation of non-believers, and there are no verses that speak of you know, qualifying statements or peace treaties or anything like that. So Al-Qurtubi, regarding that verse, he says... This verse also proves that the disbelief of non-Muslims must not prevent us from being just to them. And it is not permissible for us to retaliate in the same manner, even if they kill our women and children and cause sorrow to befall us. It is not permissible for us to act likewise with the intention of making them feel grief and sorrow. So you see, and I'm on five minutes running up to 30 seconds. I've already shown you from chapter 9 itself. I haven't even gone into the other chapters because, you know, I find it very strange that Robert maintains this argument when there are so many verses in the Quran which enjoin one towards peace, good conduct, righteousness. In fact, what is most ironic from this is Robert's argument that the Quran teaches war and subjugation of non-Muslims because they're non-Muslims is pretty much the same argument that Al-Qaeda makes and other Islamically motivated terrorists. So, and and it's, it's interesting because I actually used to subscribe to a lot of these views. So, so when Robert keeps perpetuating these ideas, it's, I'm, I'm kind of reminded of myself when I was a little bit younger and didn't really look at the verses in their context, especially the verses that directly precede the verses that you're quoting. Um, Secondly, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get back to this, I'm running on six and a half now, uh, the history itself shows that Muslims did not just go around killing everyone wholesale. Uh, I'm going to quote to you the example of Omar, the Caliph Omar in Jerusalem. Uh, you know, he sieged Jerusalem. They didn't attack and slaughter everyone in there. Uh, he sieged Jerusalem. And, and in one of the greatest acts to, to repudiate the Christian, the Roman Christian expulsion of Jews from Jerusalem invited the Jews back to Jerusalem. We are run uh, uh, 10 minutes or 10 seconds. So you have the verses, you have the history. Go ahead. Thank you, Mabin. Praise the Lord. We hope you are enjoying today's program, which is just a small sample of our treasure trove of classic Christian apologetic television broadcasts. ABN and the Trinity Channel have been producing world-class Christian apologetic programming for years, featuring the world's top Christian apologists. If you would like to see more of our programming, you can watch the Trinity Channel live 24-7 at www.trinitychannel.com. Please pray for us to persevere in exposing false religions and lifting high the name of Jesus. And if you would please let others know about our ministry. And now let's get back to our program. Ruben, uh, Robert, Mike's all yours for your opening statement. Yes, thank you, Ruben. Ruben, for your uh, kind and gracious in, uh, opening statement. Uh, just a few of the numerous inaccuracies, distortions, and outright falsehoods in it are among them. The first thing about the uh, the context. Let's let's go to the context. Let's look at the context. According to Asawi ibn Juzai and many others, this verse 9:29, and maybe I should actually start with quoting 9:29 just so that everyone knows what exactly we're talking about. Uh, fight against those who believe not in Allah, nor in the last day, nor forbid that which has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, and those who acknowledge not the religion of truth, even among the people of the book, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Now, according to these Islamic authorities, 
and I invite you to uh, give me others that contradict this. Uh, he's, they say, this ayat was revealed when the Messenger of Allah was commanded to fight the Byzantines. When it was sent down, the Messenger of Allah prepared for the expedition to Tabuk, which of course became the uh, whole setting for the revelation of chapter 9 of the Quran, which was the last major chapter to be revealed with serious doctrinal content. Now, in 929, we find uh, in chapter 9 in general, we find uh, the, of course, the notorious verse of the sword, slay the unbelievers wherever you find them, and we find this verse about fighting even the people of the book, that is primarily Jews and Christians, until they submit as inferiors to the rule of the Muslims. Now, as far as uh, the context goes, you were saying that there ought to be some recognition given about the language about peace treaties in the first part of the chapter. Now, uh, it's very important to note that there is a peace treaty that's offered to the people of the book in that particular verse. If they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued, then there's peace with the Muslims. But that means that they submit to the dimma, to the contract of protection, which was institutionalized discrimination against non-Muslims, against the Jews and Christians, forbidding them to build new houses of worship or repair old ones, to have authority over Muslims. They had to pay this special tax that the non-Muslims, that the Muslims did not have to pay, and so on. Now, that, according to Islamic law, is justice. So when Qurtabi says that uh, even our dis their disbelief doesn't prevent our being just to them, there is nothing in Qurtabi, and I challenge you to quote it if it's there, but it isn't, that Qurtabi does not say, don't fight them, don't make them pay the jizya, don't make them submit. As a matter of fact, he says just the opposite. But as far as Qurtabi is concerned, that's justice. So being just to everyone means making the Jews and Christians submit as inferiors, that is to be subjugated, as according to the de debate topic tonight, they are to be subjugated under the rule of Islamic law. Now, were th had the Byzantines attacked the Muslims? No, they had not. M Muhammad moved, according to Islamic tradition, against the Byzantine garrison at Tabuk entirely unprovoked. And were the people there pagans? No, they were, they were Christians. They were Christians of the Byzantine Empire. So when we look actually at the historical context of the passage, we find that it actually is calling for an attack that was completely unprovoked. So when you say that the attack was only uh, when we, we, we only fight when we're attacked and we only fight against the pagans, that's actually not at all so in connection with this verse. Also, there are, uh, Ibn Juzai says that this verse is a command to fight the people of the book, denying their belief in, because they deny that Allah is the uh, true God and Muhammad is his messenger. And so the fight is because they do not believe. That is the reason for it. The, the subjugation then follows. Uh, the Tafsir al-Jalalain says that w when chapter 9 verse 29 specifies that Muslims must fight against those who follow not the religion of truth, it means that Muslims must fight against those who do not follow Islam, which is firm and abrogates other religions. And Ibn Kathir says that this is because the non-Muslims were in bad faith and they have to be made to feel their bad faith. They have to be made to feel the sting of the punishment of Allah because of their rejection of Allah and Muhammad and Islam by being subjugated under these various laws. Asawi specifies that the payment of the jizya signifies that non-Muslims are humble and obedient to the judgments of Islam. Asayudi says that the jizya is not taken from someone in a state of hardship, although many times in many places it was. And sometimes the, the, the people of the book, when they had to pay this tax, were subject to various humiliations, were slapped, were spat upon, and so on, because they had to feel themselves subdued in accord with the, uh, with, with the uh, command of the Quran. Ibn Kathir says that the dhimmis must be degraced, humiliated, disgraced, humiliated, and belittled. Therefore, Muslims are not allowed to honor the people of the dhimma or elevate them above Muslims, for they are miserable, disgraced, and humiliated. Now, there are many, many other uh, Quran commentators and Islamic scholars who say this kind of thing. You predicted that I would quote them, and I will go on quoting them. But the problem is that the fact that there are others who might say otherwise does not mitigate the fact that Muslims are actually acting upon these verses all around the world today. It's obvious 
Now, you say, well, you're just endorsing the extremist view. No, I'm reporting on the fact that what you call the extremist view is frighteningly mainstream and that Christians are being persecuted in Nigeria, in Egypt, in Pakistan, in Iraq, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, and elsewhere because of Muslims understanding the, this passage and chapter 9 in general and the Quran in general and Muhammad saying, I have been commanded to fight until people, uh, against people until they acknowledge that there is no God but Allah and that I am his messenger. Muslims are acting upon these understandings. So it's all very well to say that, well, there are alternative views. But what would really be the response of someone who actually endorsed the alternative views and did not agree with the idea that non-Muslims ought to be waged war against and subjugated as inferiors, humiliated and disgraced under the rule of Islamic law and denied basic rights, it would seem that it would be far more important to be talking to the Muslims who believe these things and trying to convince them that their understanding of Islam is wrong rather than uh, your, your, statement was, your opening statement was full of attacks on me as if I originated these things. Well, you know, you know as well as I do, Muslims aren't listening to me. Muslims are listening to the authorities that I quoted and many others like them. And the unfortunate fact is that nowhere in the Islamic world is there a mosque or an Islamic school or any Muslim organization in the United States or Canada or Europe that has any kind of program to teach that the understanding of Islam held by Al-Qaeda and held by these people that you call extremists and blame me for reporting on their activities, nowhere is there a program showing that those, that understanding of Islam is wrong. And yet young Muslims are falling prey to it left and right and falling prey to it all over the world. This is a scandal and a horror of unimaginable proportions. And the difficulty that you have is that you're going against the, uh, an understanding of Islam that is very mainstream. I'm out of time? You are out of okay. time. Thank you. Welcome back to our program, Christianity, Islam, and America. I'm your host, Pastor Joseph. I pray that you enjoyed that clip. Indeed, uh, this uh, debate between Robert Spencer and Mubin Sheikh some years ago that was recorded right here at AB and the Trinity Channel, a uh, fascinating issue that is uh, seldom, if ever, dealt with in a forthright manner. Americans, unfortunately, and Westerners in particular, are unable to access the truth about this issue because of the hot-button political correct nature of this issue. But we thank God for folks like Robert Spencer and others who have not only studied the religion of Islam, but debated many Muslims many times and also uh, have done a great deal of research dealing with uh, former Muslims who've come to Christ, uh, others who have sought political asylum, who have uh, confirmed uh, his uh, research and our research. And uh, that, of course, is research into what Islam says about itself. You see, we as Christians should not be afraid of the truth. Unfortunately, sometimes, even in our Christian circles, we're afraid of speaking ill of other viewpoints. And uh, this is a, a pluralistic time that we live in. Uh, the, the new age has dawned. Postmodernism and pluralism and uh, I'm okay, you're okay. But of course, the Bible is not that way. And as a matter of fact, neither is the Quran. Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And we understand that Jesus says, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads into everlasting life. And few there be that find it. But broad is the way to destruction and many there be that enter in thereat. So we understand that uh, there is only one way. Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, and therefore other religions which deny the death, bell, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, deny the integrity and the inerrancy of the Word of God, the Holy Bible, these religions cannot be true. and We should not be afraid to say so. As a matter of fact, our nation depends. The bedrock of our republic, the United States of America, is truly, as Andrew Jackson said, the Bible, and the Bible alone. Our founders knew that. And so we should not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it alone is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We thank God for Robert Spencer pointing out 
that when you study Islam and you study the Quran and you study the context and you study the history as folks like Osama bin Laden did, as folks like Caliph al-Baghdadi and ISIS, those folks are not just uh, Muslims who have not had training. The leader of ISIS, he had a PhD in Islamics. Osama bin Laden was not some poor illiterate, but a rich uh, Saudi who knew Islam well. These Muslims committing acts of terror in the name of Islam are quoting chapter and verse every time of the Quran. They're quoting the Hadith. They're quoting the very words and the actions and the example of Muhammad himself. What does all this mean? It means that Islam does in fact teach violence. It does teach war. It does teach jihad. And jihad in the Quran is almost always violent, physical fighting against non-Muslims. One of the keys to knowing about Islam is to learn the Arabic language, and I've been pleased to be able to learn Arabic to the extent that I can go to the Quran, and we can begin to unveil the truth about the religion of Islam. The Quran was originally written in Arabic, and it, this, of course, is an Arabic-English translation, but certain words and certain phrases, when we say this teaches war, this teaches violence, this teaches killing, unfortunately, there are Muslim apologists in the West who will say no, and they know the difference. But we need to understand that in the religion of Islam, they do not have the same view of the truth as we do. As a matter of fact, in the religion of Islam, it is all right to deceive and to actually tell lies if it is for the furtherance of the religion. And we'll be looking at that in uh, new programs that we hope to bring to you, broadcast right here at Christianity, Islam, and America through the Training Channel. If you've been blessed by our programs, I encourage you to go to our website, www.trinitychannel.com. Find out more about our dynamic worldwide ministry of exposing falsehood, exposing error, and indeed Islam, uh, and exalting Jesus Christ. And Christianity, the only true religion on the face of the earth. Please pray for this ministry. We need your prayers. We also need your financial support. The gospel is free, but preaching it on uh, channels like this is not. We need your support today. If you feel moved to support uh, this ministry, please uh, send a check to the address you find on the screen or give us a call at 248-416-1300. We are the Trinity Channel, a lone voice of truth crying out in a desert wasteland of political correctness. I am your host, Pastor Joseph, right here for Christianity, Islam, and America. Good night and God bless. Praise the Lord. We hope you are enjoying today's program, which is just a small sample of our treasure trove of classic Christian apologetic television broadcasts. ABN and the Trinity Channel have been producing world-class Christian apologetic programming for years, featuring the world's top Christian apologists. If you would like to see more of our programming, you can watch the Trinity Channel live 24-7 at www.trinitychannel.com. Please pray for us to persevere in exposing false religions and lifting high the name of Jesus. And if you would please let others know about our ministry.